So we learned about sequence diagrams in the last lecture. And if you haven't le well, listened to the last lecture, you're going to want to go back and listen to the one on sequence diagrams. Because now we're going to be talking about communication diagrams. A sequence diagram shows the communication that occurs between objects within a use case, objects and actors within a use case, over a sequence of time. But if I look at my original sequence diagram that we created in the last um, video, you're going to notice that <clears throat> without a little bit of research, I'm not going to be able to tell immediately whether or not a patient actor is ever directly communicating with, say, an appointment object. Now, I can follow the lines here and there, but it would take me a little bit of research to determine, say, whether a receptionist is ever communicating directly with an appointment, whether a patient is ever communicating directly with an appointment. Let's say, for instance, whether a patient object is ever communicating directly with an appointment. These sorts of communications or relationships are not immediately apparent through the use of a sequence diagram. Therefore, the next type of diagram that we are going to talk about is called a communication diagram. And the point of a communication diagram is to show us whom is communicating with whom. So communication diagrams, once again, show us all the actors and the objects that are making up this communication within this use case. But now the connections that we're going to make are who is communicating with whom. So we are going to have undirected lines um, indicating the fact that there is communication occurring. We are not going to show any of the return messages because if there is a communication going one way, we're just going to make the assumption that there is a communication, the potential for a communication known as a return message coming back the other direction. What we are going to do is we're going to label each one of the lines that are connecting the objects with the messages that are occurring and we're going to indicate which direction those messages are going. So the elements of a communication diagram can be found on page 249 in your book, figure 6-9, which can be found under interaction diagrams in chapter 6. There are, once again, actors and objects who are interacting with one another. There is an undirected association line that just connects objects and actors to one another. And then there are messages that are being passed back and forth, which will show the directionality of the communication. And then, of course, we also have guard conditions. And then the, the frame, which is going to show us the boundary of the, the uh, diagram. So we're going to create a new diagram here. And this time, I am going to use the components from a use case diagram. So I'm going to click on the more shapes. I'm going to go down to Software and Database. I'm going to select Software, and I want to uh, check on Use Case because I need most of the shapes and the objects, or the shapes that I'm going to use, would be part of a Use Case diagram. We also need some <clears throat> additional shapes, and so I'll just go into More Shapes, make sure I select More Shapes. I'm going to click on General, and then I just need some basic shapes. So if you'll notice down the side, I have my sequence diagram shapes, which we have used in the last two diagrams that we did in the last lecture. I have just added shapes from a use case, and I've added shapes from just some basic shapes that we need. Because a use case diagram, I'm going to drag some actors onto the screen, because in the sequence diagram that I created before, let me come back to the one that we created in the first lecture, I have two actors, a patient and a receptionist. And then I have three objects that we identified, a patient, unpaid bills, and appointments. So if I come back to the diagram that we are modeling here, I need two actors, a patient and a receptionist, and then I need three objects. And so I'm just going to go under basic shapes, and I'm going to drag some rectangles on. I'll drag three rectangles on. I'm going to make them a little bit smaller so that they're kind of shaped a good size for... <coughs> The rest of the shapes on the screen, I'll just make them a little bit smaller. And then I'm going to zoom in so that we can label each one of these. All right, so I'm pretty sure that the first actor who initiated this whole entire communication to occur was a patient. The second actor who was involved in this is a receptionist. And then we have three objects or instances of a class. 
The first one would have been a patient object, which was a instance of a patient class. The second object that we dealt with in our, in our sequence diagram was an unpaid bill. and an object of an unpaid bill class. And the last one was an object of an appointment class. So I'm going to double click on this box. I'm going to put the colon to indicate that it is an instance of a class. And then I'm going to type the class name, appointment. So these are the three objects. I'll zoom in a little bit closer. These are the three objects that are interacting with, excuse me, these are the five objects that are interacting in our system, if I go back to our original sequence diagram, I can see the five across the top. Now, I see that there are a number of communications that are going on. So a communication diagram is going to indicate, I am going to go back to my use case um, shapes. I'm going to click on a general association, which notice an association doesn't include any sort of arrows, a directionality of the uh, association. It just connects with lines, objects. So there is a connection between a patient and a receptionist. I know that because the very first communication that takes place is the patient asks the receptionist for an appointment. <clears throat> so the next thing that I'm going to do is I want to indicate the directionality of the, the communication. The communication is going between a patient and a receptionist. So I'm going to select a generalization line because there is an arrow at the end of a generalization. And then I'm going to draw a line in undetached line here indicating that there is a communication that is going from the patient to the receptionist. And then I'm going to double click on this line and I'm going to type the, the a message that is being sent. Request appointment <clears throat> with the name and the address. So now the next thing that I want to do is we're going to number these sequentially. This is the first communication that takes place, so I'm going to put the number one in front of this. So if I go back to my sequence diagram, what is the second message that is being passed? The second message is between the receptionist to the patient object, and it is look up patient with the attributes, or excuse me, with the parameters of name and address. So I'll come back to this diagram. There is a relationship that is occurring, a general association between a receptionist and a patient object. And that very, the second communication that occurs, I'm going to use generalization again in order to indicate the directionality of the communication. So I'll draw the line. I'm going to double click on it and I'm going to type the message that is being passed. This is the second message that is being passed and this is look up patient, passing name and address as parameters. Then let's see if we can find the third communication. If I come back, remember we are not going to be mapping out or indicating diagramming return messages. So I'm not concerned about this return message exists or not. I'm concerned about this message. If the patient exists, we're going to look up the bill. That goes between the receptionist and the unpaid bill object, and there is a guard condition on it. And so I'm going to come back to my communication diagram. I'm going to add an association between the receptionist and the unpaid bill object, and then I'm going to use a generalization line because it will allow me to indicate the directionality of the communication. And here I am going to indicate the guard condition, which goes in the square brackets. <clears throat> if the patient exists as a guard condition, that would go inside of the square brackets. And if the patient exists, then we are going to look up bills. That is an operation. So I'm going to include the parentheses indicating that it's an operation. All right, and I also want to indicate the sequence number. So in the beginning, I'm going to put a three in front of it. So now I can see that this is my third communication. So if I look, the fourth communication that is occurring is coming back from the receptionist. Whether or not she has found unpaid bills, the next communication is going from the receptionist back to the patient. 
So if I come back to my communication diagram, I already have a line. It looks like I have created an a generalization. So this is supposed to be just a, an association line. Let me draw it one more time. An undirected line connecting the receptionist and the patient. I didn't want an arrowhead at the beginning of that. Now I'm going to select a generalization to indicate a communication that's going back from the receptionist to the patient, an arrowed line. And this one is going to be my fourth communication. So if I double click on this line, I'm going to say, the message was, do you want to make, cancel, or change appointment? So do you want to make, change, or cancel appointment? And it is a message. It is a operation, so I'm going to put the parentheses after it. So that is going to be communication number four. <clears throat> um, the return message from the patient saying, I want to make an appointment, we are going to ignore that for now. We have another um, communication that occurs between the patient and the receptionist. I'm going to draw another directed line with the arrow pointing at the patient. And this is when the receptionist asks the patient for the appointment times. The date and time, I think that's what we called it. Let me change that. The date and time of the appointment that they would like. Once again, we are not going to model the return messages back from the patient to the receptionist. But I'm pretty sure that once the receptionist has asked the question of the patient, of the patient what date and time do you want the appointment, the patient is going to respond with the answer here. Then the receptionist is going to communicate with the appointment object, which means I'm going to come back to my communication diagram. I'm going to click on association, and there is a line between the receptionist and the appointment. <clears throat> then I'm going to use a generalization to indicate that there is a communication that is occurring this direction from the receptionist to the appointment. If I double click on it, I can add the message that was being sent, match appointments with the date and the time of the requested appointment from the patient. And I have to number that to indicate the fact that this is number six in the sequence, that this message is number six in the sequence. And then the last and the final communication that occurs is the communication from the appointment back to the receptionist indicating, or excuse me, the, the appointment indicates whether or not that time was available. We have the potential to run those uh, messages over and over again. But finally, once we have found an available date and time, the final message is going to occur between the receptionist to the appointment saying, all right, make that appointment. So I'm going to give one more line. We will label this as number seven. And this is going to be from the receptionist to the appointment object. And it is going to be create appointment. And so now, when I look at this diagram, I can immediately tell who is communicating with whom. If I wanted to make this a little bit nicer, one of the things that I can do, I see that this line right here is not quite long enough for me to indicate or for me to see the arrow. So I'm going to make it a little bit longer. And another one of the things that you will notice is that we can put all of the communications that are occurring above the line. So I can tell immediately just on looking at this, I can tell that there is communication that is occurring back and forth from the patient to the receptionist. If I look at this, I can also see that there is a one-way communication that is occurring or there is communication that is occurring between the receptionist and the patient object. I can also see that there is a communication occurring from the receptionist to the unpaid bill object. If I drag this out, I can also see that this line is not quite long enough. There we go. Now I can see the aerial. <clears throat> and then I can see that there are multiple communications that are occurring between the receptionist and the appointment object. If I look at the numbers that I put in front of them, one, two, three, four. Oh, the date and time. We didn't put a time, we didn't put a number in front of the date and time. If I double click on it, that is the number five. 
when she requested the date and time from the patient. I can immediately tell in this communication diagram that there is never any communication between a patient and, say, an appointment object, because there is no association line connecting the two. I can equally tell at a glance that there is no communication between a patient and a patient's own patient object. So let's say, for instance, a part of the system that you are designing is allowing a patient to make their own appointments online automatically. They do not have to go through a receptionist to make appointments. Under those conditions, there perhaps might be a direct communication between a patient and an appointment class. But in this scenario, we have a receptionist who is an a, uh, intermediary who is acting between a patient and all of the um, objects within the system, all of the classes within the system. And so the purpose of a communication diagram is to show us, as I mentioned before, whom is connected to whom. <clears throat> Once again, we can also use a, if a message is repeated over and over again, we can use an asterisk in front of the number. So if I notice match appointment, this can be executed multiple, multiple times. So I would put an asterisk in front of the match appointment, and then I would put an asterisk in front of date and time because these can occur multiple times as the receptionist and the patient attempt to find an appropriate time. <clears throat> and the last thing that I would want to include is the frame or the boundary of this system. And so I'm going to zoom out just a little bit. I'm going to drop a subsystem on the screen. I think I'm still on my pointer tool, so I should be able to drag it. so that it encompasses the entire boundary of the system. <laughs> and then I can label it so that I know which system this is. If I click on the name, it allows me to once again indicate that this is the make appointment use case. And I have a communication diagram where I can quickly and easily see who is communicating with whom. And the last and final diagram that we're going to be talking about in Chapter 6 is a behavioral state machine. And that will be the next lecture.